Good morning, good evening, wherever you are. Happy International Women's Day. This is Carolina haylock -Lor. I will be moderating this webinar today. And I would like to start by explaining some technical aspects for this webinar. Everyone except for our panelists and speakers will be automatically muted today for this webinar. All cameras will be off. Some of you will join from Spanish-speaking countries or English or French-speaking countries. Some participants or panelists will speak in Spanish, English or French during this webinar. Therefore, we provide simultaneous interpretation in order to ensure how you can listen to this discussion in the correct language. Everyone, including the listeners, can select the globe icon where it says interpretation at the bottom part of your screen in Zoom. And you can select either Spanish, English or French, depending on which is your language. Also, we would like to ask you to be muted unless you want to speak or unless the moderator is asking you something specifically. This webinar will last one hour and this will include a discussion session with questions and answers. This will last around 17 minutes and this will be an excellent opportunity so that you can ask questions to our panelists and therefore you are more than free and welcome to send your questions in the chat or at the Q&A function that you can find at the bottom part of your screen at any time during this webinar. And please remember that this webinar will be recorded in order to watch it later on by the users. As I was telling you before, this is Carolina Heilocklor. I will be the moderator today. I am anesthesiologist, intensivist and interventional pain physician in San Pedro Sula, Honduras in Central America. I am the director of programs on the WFSA board. And I am also chair at the DEI committee from the WFSA. In the book, How to Win Back Your Female Talent, the authors Cristina and Janetis and Nicola Watler ask themselves how it is possible that we are losing many things and it shows the talent gap. And now I will mention these observations. According to them, women are leaving their professional careers and it is important to stop this talent leave. We cannot allow ourselves to have this lust of half of our intelligence force, creativity, intuition, and experience that we as women attract. To lose women from our workforce has a real cost in our society, and we need to look for practical ways in order to repair this leave and help to promote innovation. Today, I am I have the pleasure to share this webinar with brilliant women in anesthesia who are innovators, leaders, pioneers, and we can learn a lot from them today in International Women's Day. And now without further ado, I will present my, well, I will present Dr. Bertil Key. She's the head of anesthesia and intensive care department at the Center Hospitalier Universitaire Pédiatrique Charles de Gaulle in Burkina Faso. Bertille is a prominent champion of female anesthesiologists across West Africa and has worked with leading NGOs, such as, for example, Kids OR and Lifebox on anesthesia improvement and educational projects. Bertille, you can go ahead, you have the floor. Thank you, Carolina. Hello to everyone. And before to start on my presentation, I wanted to wish you a very happy International Women's Day. 
And I wanted to say thank you to the WFSA for inviting me to participate in this session, which uh, touches upon the challenges that women have to uh, face, uh, especially in Africa, in Sub-Saharan Africa. Can you switch slides, please? So to start, I would like to say that going to school and uh, finishing your um, higher education curriculum is still a major challenge for uh, women and girls in Sub-Saharan Africa. Next slide. Because the idea that um, dominates in this region is that the woman belongs at home and therefore young girls need to be prepared to be a good wife, a good mother, and not go to school. Uh, because it, and that means it's not um, easy for them to, to, to learn these skills there. Another idea that was very common maybe 10 years ago, and that is still true today, is that anesthesiology is not necessarily a speciality for women because it's too demanding and has too irregular um, scheduling. Next slide. And so what we can say at this point is that women in this region who are currently anesthesiologists are very lucky and very determined because they haven't only uh, finished their normal studies but they've also had to overcome a, a path really um, that was very, very difficult to become anesthesiologists. So a few years ago, in many uh, sub-Saharan African countries, there were no available training courses within these countries. And so to specialize in this sector, women had to leave their country which means that they have to leave their family for at least four years, which has uh, repercussions on the family. And families often um, didn't like this separation, which often impacted the education of children. And I will tell you a story that um, uh, was told to me. So a young woman who was specializing as an anesthesiologist um, abroad had come home during her break and her family came together, so her husband and her children, during a conversation to, to make their disagreement clear. And the children said that they were talking as a family with, her fa with their father, signaling that she was no longer a part of the family because she was abroad. So this is an example of the difficulties that these young women face to become anesthesiologists. Next slide. And once that they have graduated, they need to be able to integrate as women within this professional environment. And they then have to face new difficulties. And often these difficulties are born of the fact that we continue to believe that women should not be outside of the home, should not occupy high ranking positions, um, especially not um, so prestigious as being an anesthesiologist. Next slide. Because this job, this job as an anesthesiologist gives you power, it gives you a leading role that a lot of men um, have difficulties with. They don't like having to obey orders coming from a woman, even if they're technical orders. So I have a technical experience about this, a personal experience about this. So during a, um, um, a session, I wanted to give my um, opinion and a colleague said to me that I uh, didn't have anything, I shouldn't be saying anything because I was a woman. But I wasn't speaking as a woman, I was speaking as an anesthesiology specialist and therefore we were able to continue the discussion. Next slide. And being an anesthesiologist means that you're going to be working long days. It means that you're going to have a lot of on-duty shift. So you're going to be away from home a lot of the time. 
and these this absence is often misunderstood or not accepted by children and by partners. For example, the partner of one of my colleagues said, well, I'm the one who keeps the children. Um, I'm the one who takes care of them because you women anesthesiologists are never home. And so I replied, well, women anesthesiologists are not, not more absent from the home than women who are ministers, who are businesswomen, or who work in the private sector. And so the problem is not really that we are anesthesiologists, but the fact that women must be able to work and reconcile their work with their family life. And that reflects uh, negative stereotypes um, regarding women who work. And women who are anesthesiologists are often or sometimes uh, accused of infidelity by their um, husbands because of the long uh, working hours. And so often you have to convince them that's not the case. And that adds an extra weight um, to, to everything that you have to juggle and to the stress of being an anesthesiologist on a daily basis. Next slide. And beyond these difficulties linked to society and family, Women anesthesiologists are not represented in high ranking positions, be it in hospitals or universities. In West Africa, for example, I'll give you a few examples uh, regarding women professors. So in Ivory Coast, Benin, Togo, Mali and Guinea Conakry, we have no women professors um, for about 10 men professors. In Burkina Faso, I am the only woman uh, professor out of six. And in Niger, there is one woman for three um, total posts. Next slide, please. Next slide again. This um, lack of representation of women is not necessarily linked to a question of marginalization or sex-based marginalization, but we still need to discuss this problem because what we're seeing is that medicine is becoming more and more feminized. A study has shown that is the case in Africa uh, but that is not the case in anesthesiology. There's not been any uh, increase in, in the number of women in that specialty. But another African study has recently shown that in uh, final examinations in anesthesiology, women were uh, performing just as well as men. And actually, during clinical examinations, they were actually performing better than men. Next. So this lack of visibility within faculty and within hospitals means that we do not have women who are role models and are able to attract uh, other younger women into the profession. And so having fewer women in these positions means that they do not have the possibility to support young colleagues who would want to start a career in anesthesiology in sub-Saharan Africa. Next slide. However, despite these difficulties, women anesthesiologists are doing this work every day and are bravely doing it and are doing it very well because being a woman means that they are uh, more gentle, they're more patient, and so they bring more comfort to the patients. Um, often we also manage to calm conflicts between men or between men and ourselves and create a better working atmosphere within the teams. Next slide. And so here I'd like to introduce you to our team. So this is at the end of a surgical procedure to separate conjoined twins. It was, it went very well. And so in my hospital, we are only women. So here we have two anesthesiologists on the photo and two more who are training uh, 
uh, in the specialty. Next slide. And despite all of this, we do have women who are occupying high ranking positions in Africa um, in Sub-Saharan Africa, especially. So here, for example, you see Professor Jacqueline Zeminkande from Cameroon, who is the president of the African Conference of Francophone Deans and Medical Schools. She is currently in this position. And here you see Professor Elisabeth Diouf from Senegal, who was um, the president of the Society of Anesthesia in Francophone Africa. So to finish, I would say that it is possible to have hope to see women in anesthesia occupy a better position to be able to attract more women to the specialization and to, to keep it alive. So here you see the two young women in the middle. Uh, they um, achieved the uh, prizes on, in communication, so in Randa in Kigali. And on that, I would like to say thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Bertil. This was such an impressive message that gets to the bottom of our hearts to keep our hope up in this fight to make women visible in anesthesia. I am now going to introduce a person who's really special for me. She was the president of this World Federation. I love her so much. I really appreciate her. And I've learned a lot from her. Yannick Meli Olsen is the president, was the president of the WFSA. He's also an anesthesiologist at Verum Hospital in Norway. He was the president of the European Board and anesthesiologist, and she was actually the only female, the only woman in, in this position. And she was a driving force behind the development and adoption of the Helsinki, Helsinki Declaration on Patient Safety and Anesthesiology. Janika holds the night first class of the Order of St. Olaf in her country. This is the highest civilian honor currently conferred by Norway in recognition of her services to healthcare. Janka was the first female medical doctor in Norway to complete the military service, which she did in South Lebanon with the UN forces. To all of you, Yannick Meli Olsen, you have the floor. Thank you very much for that very nice introduction, uh, which took a long time. So, uh, <laughs> but uh, thank you so much. And I must say, Berti, thank you for sharing your, uh, your uh, experiences. And so mine are quite different coming from a high income country in Northern Europe. And so, so this will be interesting to see how we have similarities and, uh, and differ differences. Next slide, please. Next. So you can wonder, this little girl here, when she had just decided to go to medical school, how was her tour from that position to, next slide please, several years later, giving uh, um, uh, some input to the World Health Assembly. When I decided to become a medical doctor, I th thought I had to be a nurse because uh, girls did not study medicine at that time. But then I was shown a role model and I thought, okay, I can do it. And since then, since the age of five, my path was set. Next slide, please. So when I went to medical school at that time, there were 25% females. Now it's more than 70% uh, percent females. So things have changed different, uh, changed very much. But what I saw in that uh, time is that the men were, or boys, whatever, that they were very eager to do uh, things clinically and things. But we, in general, femur said, no, you must do it before me and I cannot do that. We were placing ourselves behind all the boys ourselves. And of course, then the men learned more than we did. So we had to step up. Next slide, please. 
And then what happened more or less by coincidence that I became the first female physician in Norway to complete my military services. I did my officers training with the 60 men and 60 men and me, quite interesting. Next slide, please. But uh, what I saw then when I did that, I was uh, well treated as the only female in the battalion's uh, leadership and so on probably because I was a professional and they all soldiers knew that they needed a professional in, in the medic in order to survive. So I had very good experience from that. Uh, next, please. But also for many years, I was the only female in the anesthesia department in those hospitals where I worked for several years. As you can see, I liked being with the men. And I learned a lot of their way to behave and so, and I will tell you some of those things. Next, please. Uh, but that, that does not mean that I was not exposed to what is called as suppression techniques. And these are subtle ways that people treat each other. It doesn't have to be male females, but it could be male females. And these are uh, a list of those suppression techniques, making invisible, Ridiculing, withholding information, damned if you do and damned if you don't, help heaping blame, putting to shame, force or threat of force, and objectifying. I will go into detail. Next, please. When it comes to make invisible, it's not so easy to make me invisible, as you can see here. Next, please. But that does not mean that it cannot happen. That you find that when you are going rounds in the ICU, the 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 other doctors, the surgeons, they will speak to the other men, even though these men might not be in charge of the patient. But this is some advice. You can create alliances. If this is happening, you should talk to people who, who do that or who observe that. And you can ask the people to explain, why are you not talking to me? I am in charge here, next please. Then you come to, you have all heard that people are making fun and making jokes on your behalf. And uh, it's not really very nice and you don't know what to do. A very typical um, reaction is to laugh with those who uh, make jokes about you. But you should not laugh. Again, you should make some alliances. Speak to people who are uh, doing, uh, uh, you, you trust and so. And do not let the joke pass without commenting. Why, why are you saying this to me, Jan? So next, please. Then you come to people. This is also very typical. If you are the only woman, maybe the men go for a golfing round. They go to the bar while you go home to the children and so on and so. And they will discuss work and they will come back to you and give you some, well, we decided this and that and you were not in the room. So talk to them one by one. What do you mean by that? Why, how did this happen? Can you explain how you came to that decision and so? And then demand transparent decision processes. Next, please. And this is also a very typical situation that many females will uh, experience, that you feel that you have to go home to look after your children, which is more usual for men, no, females than for men. But at the same time, you have obligations that work. You feel bad in either situation. It's really a very bad choice for you. But then what is important to you at your stage now and make those priorities clear from the beginning. Well, I told you I had to go back with my children. And so that then it's clear. It doesn't solve everything, but it helps. Next slide, please. And then this is so typical, for instance, when it comes to sexual harassment, how many victims of harassment do not feel that they are guilty. And then you should really try how are those influence, how this this come uh, uh, upon, is it about you or is it about a gender system? Next, please. And then you have probably all been uh, uh, subjected to this. Well, you will understand this better when you get a little older. Who are you talking to me? I have 30 years of experience. You have only two years. So again, we should be aware and we should arrest others when we see people are doing this to other people. Next, please. And this is uh, the 
past president of the Norwegian Surgical Society, he said something very interesting and that he felt that females actually were better surgeons than men. But the thing is that they had to be pushed, supported and so somehow. But many of the men, they were just too tough and they had to be, you know, calmed down and restricted somehow. So they need different guidance and to feel safe. Next, please. One other thing I have learned quite a lot about, and that is when I worked for an American company dealing with in-flight medical uh, emergencies for several years. And that is that we are often too shy to step forward. In that American system, people were saying, I can do this. I am, they, they showed some self-confidence, which I feel, at least in my setting, we often lack and we should be better at putting ourselves up and, and I can do it. Next. Next, please. And that, as I has been mentioned, those slides are maybe not that interesting now. It has been mentioned I was the first president uh, female of the European Board of Anesthesiology, as we've seen here. Again, feeling very well supported by, by the men in that position. The same for the next slide. When I, for since Angela Enright stepped down, I was the only elected female member of the WFSA board for two periods. There were other females on the board, but they were elected from council. Next, uh, please. And again, I felt very much supported by those men in the WFSA leadership. Next, please. But then to another point, and this is my niece told me after seeing that picture, oh, Janneke, look at you among those old gray men. And you are really a role model. And then that made me feel that, yes, actually, we are all role models for each other. We should always remember that whenever we act in any situation at the hospital, we are role models, Aperti also alluded to, that we should always think that we can inspire and help others. Next. And that was what my, my uh, uh, the nurses in ICU put on the wall when I had been elected as a WFSA president. And I felt that is so much an appreciation for what we can do. Next, please. And again, uh, what a, a female orthopedic surgeon told us that we must remember that we have the power within us and try to support each other. Next, please. So as you can see, I have not always taken the safe track for ladies and kids, but I have felt supported along the way. Next, please. Again, from, from the WFSA board and council meeting, which I'm so privileged to have been part of, but I should not forget, next slide, that I am privileged. I am uh, from a country which is number three in the global uh, gender gap report. We are among the very best. We have so many privileges. Part of that is actually because we have compulsory leave, uh, paternal leave when we have babies, that the fathers also have to stay at home with their children. So that means that they take more responsibility on, on the home front. And I think that we should also remember that they lose out a lot when they do not take responsibility for families and so. So it's not only to empower females, but to empower men to take that responsibility and have, lead a full life. Next, please. And this is, uh, I, I'm going towards the end, but if you see at the current pace, when are regions likely to close the gap? And you see again, I'm from a very privileged part of the world. If you compare from, uh, from South Asia, which we will hear more about soon, it's 197 years, uh, while in Europe we had to wait only 60 years to have all gender gaps closed. And then we will have a better world for both men and females. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Janneke. We are so happy to listen to you. And thank you so much 
for being a role model as a woman that we can all follow. Thank you. As I said before, you are more than welcome to send your questions at the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. You can do it anytime during this session. We invite you and encourage you to do it. And now I would like to introduce Dr. Sheila Nainan Miatra. She has been working as a consultant in the Department of Anesthesiology, Critical Care and Pain at the Tata Memorial Hospital from Mumbai for 20 years. She is Professor of Critical Care at the Homi Baba National Institute University. She is the president of the Indian Society of Critical Care Medicine and chairs the Intensive and Critical Care Medicine Committee of the WFSA. She is the immediate past president and founding member of the All India Difficult Airway Association and the Chancellor of the Indian College of Critical Care Medicine. Sheila will explain her experience, personal experience as an anesthesiologist and medical leader in India. Sheila, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Carolina, for that very kind introduction. At the outset, I'd like to wish you all a very happy International Women's Day and a special thanks to the World Federation of Society of Anesthesiologists for giving me this opportunity uh, to share my experiences. We've had two uh, fantastic presentations from uh, Bertil and Yannike, and each one has such unique experiences, and I'm sure my experiences are going to be a little different. Maybe some things may be similar. As already introduced, I'm uh, uh, Sheila Maitra. I'm uh, a professor of anesthesiology and critical care. I work at the Tata Memorial Hospital in Mumbai, uh, India, which is a metro city on the west coast of, uh, uh, of uh, India. And this is the hospital where I work. It is a mixed, um, it's a cancer hospital. It's Asia's largest cancer hospital. And it's one of the largest cancer hospitals in the world in terms of patient registry. Uh, my base specialty is anesthesia. These are our operating rooms. And uh, though now I work as a uh, intensive uh, critical care specialist, I do spend a lot of time in the operating room. And my passion is uh, airway management. And uh, I spend a lot of time doing uh, difficult airway management in the operating room, especially when there are challenging cases. But most of the time uh, I spend is in the uh, critical care uh, unit. I'm a critical care specialist, as I mentioned. And uh, we have a mixed medical surgical uh, intensive care unit. Uh, so I deal with both medical and surgical uh, uh, cases in the uh, intensive care unit. And my areas of interest and uh, research are uh, airway management, hemodynamic monitoring, and uh, sepsis. So this is just a little background to uh, the work I do. And uh, the previous speakers have talked about their experiences. And uh, I want to tell you that as a child, when I, when I would look at uh, you know, a, a successful woman, I would always uh, think that, oh, I want to be there some, someday. And I would, I would say, I would say uh, you know, she's so lucky. You know, I would always think it's just so lucky you know, to be uh, there. And um, it's only when I'd been down that path, I realized that there is a lot of struggle to that success. And sometimes as a woman, we have to be twice as good to actually, you know, be there. And I want to share, you know, some of my experiences. Now, despite being a woman living in a metro city uh, in India, I, I don't live in the rural part of India. Despite that, the journey has not been easy. There have been highs and lows, and I want to share that with you. I want to tell you that when I worked at the Tata Memorial Hospital as a resident, you know, I really wanted to be a consultant in this, uh, in this, uh, in anesthesiology, and this was like my dream job. But it just so happened that when the position opened up, I was nine months pregnant. I was full term when I applied for this. I was at the interview full term, and you know, the director just looked at me and said, "Well, you know," and I, I already sensed that, you know they were not going to take me because, you know, of my condition. And I remember telling her that, you know, please don't hold this against me. You know, I will be as good as anybody else and as any other male. And, you know, I was so fortunate to be selected for the job. And I assured my director, I will be no different from a male colleague. I'll do my best. And 
you know, it was such a hard decision for me because, you know, a woman coming from India and we have a very close knit family system. And, you know, it was like a choice between my dream job and still doing justice as a mother. You know, I made this assurance, but would I really be able to meet that? And it was such a challenge. And I said, no, I want to be a good mother. And yet I want to be a good anesthesiologist. I want to take my dream job. It's not going to be this or this. It's going to be this and this, for which I had to work very hard. And I was very fortunate because I got the support of my family and my mother. And I was fortunate to have support from my colleagues. But this has not been the experience of many women in India. And that's when I realized that it's so important to support a woman at this time in her, uh, in her time. It's a short period of your time when you need some a little more help than a male might uh, need. And subsequently, in my career in critical care, I always kept this in mind when I had female uh, colleagues or female residents and trainees who came into uh, practice. And even when I took up the job and I was so, so fascinated by critical care, I wanted to do this and, as an anesthesiologist. And people told me, oh, uh, you know, don't do critical care. Why do you want to do all these calls? It's just so labor intensive, you know, do something uh, lighter, which will be easier for you as a woman. And, you know, I felt, uh, many women might get discouraged by this kind of conversation. I was just, you know, very, uh, you know, passionate and wanted to do it despite what people said, but not everybody might be there. And sometimes both men and women discourage you from taking up your uh, dream career just because it's going to be uh, difficult. And, um, you know, throughout I was, uh, when I became a consultant and hired female colleagues, I would go up to them, talk to them, try to understand uh, what their situation is, because I, I went through this kind of experience. And I realized that you support a woman at that crucial period when she really needs your help. That woman will give you tenfold more if you show that you give her that little assistance. And that has been my experience. And subsequently, I've tried to sensitize more people to, you know, understanding what are the, it's not that women are trying to get concessions or trying to, you know, they just need a little support. And it's not, it's okay to ask people for help. It's okay to get support. And we should in turn also try to support uh, people in the, uh, in the department. Uh, subsequently, you know, as I, I started my uh, doing anesthesiology, critical care, you know, my, my interest became beyond clinical practice. I wanted uh, to be an educator. I was very interested in teaching and I was very interested in research. I wanted to do research. I'd read all these papers and I said, I want to be part of these studies. I want to do research. I want to do more. And I, I realized what a struggle this is for me because, um, you know, uh, being in a country like India, where there's a huge amount of clinical work, it's really difficult even for me and being in a university teaching hospital to get or even ask for any protected time to do any, you know, any research. So it just meant that if I had to do any of this work, it had to be after us. All the writing, all the looking up, everything had to be after us. Now, how am I going to do this with two small girls at home? The moment I came home, both the girls would jump onto me and say, mama, mama, let's play. And it was difficult with, you know, uh, managing a, a typical uh, Indian household. I had to look after my family, my children. It was just impossible to do any of this after us. So if I, if it, if I had to do all this work, it meant I had to do it after my babies went to sleep, after my husband went to sleep. So all those years, I used to actually work after everyone went to bed. It meant sleeping less, waking up early, and just working so much harder. And I thought, hey, you know, man could just come home, put on his laptop and start, you know, doing his work. But a woman doesn't get as much as support uh, at all uh, times. You know, I wanted to go to meetings. I wanted to meet people, collaborate with people like you internationally. It meant traveling. How was I going to do that with small kids? You won't believe it. But for 10 years in my life, I traveled with my children and my husband to every ASAC meeting, ASA meeting, whatever meetings around the world. I was, I was very fortunate to have support from my husband so that I could attend my meetings and still not be away uh, from my children. So those are some of the kind of, uh, you know, struggles uh, that I faced. And then as I started collaborating with more and more people, and I started meeting more and more dynamic women, that was so inspiring. You know, just hearing from their experiences, uh, understanding that yes, our problems are the same globally, and we can, you know, uh, understand each other and share our experiences and support each other. And, you know, that was really inspiring seeing many women at top positions and, you know, uh, get, you know, getting mentored by some of them was a unique experience. And 
as I went through my journey, you know, I started uh, doing more research, education, started getting more noticed, started getting more successful. And then I noticed a different kind of uh, way in which I was perceived. I started being, you know, sensing that men were getting intimidated by me a bit, you know, and, you know, it, to be fair, it wasn't even, it wasn't only men, even women were beginning to be, get intimidated. And I suddenly started to say that, oh, do I have to be apologetic for being good or for getting successful? It was almost reaching that, uh, you know, kind of stage. Then I got more and more active in critical care and I, in the critical care society. And I saw there are very few women who are coming into critical care. And I started to wonder, why is that? You know, we can't change society overnight, but definitely as professionals, we can make the environment more conducive so more and more women can join. And I saw many women who were in committees. Uh, I, I, to be fair, I, there was no discrimination, but I never saw women in leadership positions. And, you know, I thought that why is it that we are just in committees? Why, why don't, why don't if, if I think I'm good, why don't I go and why don't I just become the president of the society? Why don't I work towards this? And, um, you know, this was like my dream. And this was such a critical care was such a male dominated society. And not only male dominated, it was very specialty dominated because it was not just anesthesiologists. There were pulmonologists, there were physicians, there were surgeons, internal medicine. So anesthesia was only one part of the uh, part of the specialty. So critical care cuts across so many specialties. So not only was it specialty dominated, but it was also very male dominated. Dominated. And for 30 years, they did not have a female as a president. And when I got elected as the president of the Indian Society of Critical Care Medicine, it was a huge moment for me to become a president. But I didn't realize at that time what was the impact of being a woman president after 30 years. And I realized this when women came up to me and said, you know, you inspire us, Sheila. Because, you know, all along, we have always been part of committees. We've always been supporting the men uh, who are leaders. But after seeing you as a leader, we feel it's possible to be a leader. We look at ourselves as leaders and, we, you know, that is inspiring. And I felt at that time that I have a bigger responsibility than just being a president. Uh, you know, it's about women mentoring women, women sponsoring women, trying to identify the problem, trying to get more women in and making a more conducive environment for women to join. So this has largely been, uh, you know, the kind of role uh, that uh, I think I have a bigger responsibility now than I have uh, before, after becoming president of a society. And I see that many societies internationally uh, still don't have a female as a, uh, as a leader. And, you know, congratulations, Yannicke, for that position that you held. You know, it's, it's just inspiring. Uh, to see uh, someone in that position. And I, I just want to end by saying that the journey hasn't been easy. Anyone who says that, you know, it's it's not been difficult for me being a woman, or I've not been, I've not faced discrimination. I know many women have faced discrimination, but it's not been easy. I've really had to work very hard. And I think as women, we should not look for concessions and favors. If you want to follow your dream, whatever it may be, whether it is uh, just being uh, successful clinically or doing research or whatever, you know, follow your dream. Don't give it up. Don't let people push you down. You know, uh, to do all this, you just have to work much, much harder. And um, all along, I'm sure many women, especially women who have children and are married, always somewhere, even when they achieve success, uh, they go through, they have these pangs of guilt. I don't know what has been the experience of others, but I've always felt uh, that no, perhaps I didn't spend enough time with my girls. Uh, perhaps, you know, I was not there to pick them up from school. Sometimes I was not there at special occasions. So I always felt, okay, I became successful, but maybe I didn't, you know, I didn't do justice as a mother, or as a wife. And uh, recently my daughter who is in, medical, is in medical school, you know, she came up to me and she said, you know, mama, I want to be exactly like you. And, you know, that brought tears to my eyes, you know, because for that was like the reward for all these years of, you know, what I've done. And I actually felt that if I could inspire my two daughters and, you know, despite not having spent time with them, if they felt they want to be like me, I mean, that was like the icing on the cake. And that was a great moment that made everything worthwhile for me. So I just want to share this, these experiences. There have been so many more. But I just wanted to tell you what my journey has been and that it hasn't been easy. And I, we have to, I believe that we have to make the journey much easier for many women who haven't been as fortunate 
as perhaps the three of us have, four of us have been. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Sheila. We are so pleased to hear all of your experiences. And we are right now moving on to the many questions we have from the audience. One was directed to all of you. And how is it that your experiences as women in anesthesiology and anesthesiology has changed over the course of your careers? Any of you who want to start by addressing it can, can do it now. Yannicka? I'm sorry, I couldn't get the question. I couldn't hear the question. How has your experience as a woman in anesthesia changed over the course of your career? Well, at least for me, when I started in anesthesia, there were 17% females in the uh, 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 specialty. So I feel there are far more females now. We are now 30% uh, of specialists and 50-50 as, uh, as uh, trainees. So there are more females. And then also, the men's position in society in my setting has also changed. So when Sheila now just described the guilt for being away from children, that used to be for females. Now it's for both genders. But all feel that they are not being able to take enough care of their children. Thank you very much, uh, Bertil or Sheila. Uh, I just like to say that when I, before I joined anesthesiology, uh, there were, it was a very female dominated specialty. Yes. Uh, you know, many women, there would be like just one or two males yes. and there would be too many women. Mm. And all our professors would be women and uh, most of the residents would be women and there would be one or two men and they used to be treated like princes, you know? And I found that, I said, this is not fair, you know, why is it that just because there are very few male anesthesiology residents, why are they treated, you know, and, I, I, and they would be treated so royally by the women, and that I found was very unfair, because I remember the professors would call them and say, come on, there's this difficult, challenging intubation, why don't you do it, and I was like, why not me, you know, so it was quite, a, quite an unusual uh, experience, but I thought you should look at it in a different way, that women were you know not showing any bias to the men in fact they were being kinder to the men you know quite the opposite experience of many what many women uh, experience but now in india there are more and more males who are uh, taking up anesthesiology and more and more women who are taking up surgery so the kind of ratio is uh, almost reversing Thank you very much, Sheila. Bertil, um, we have a question for you to tell us which advice would you give as a medicine student who's thinking on specializing in, in anesthesiology? Bertil, floor is yours. Thank you. I used to say to my students, is the best specialty anesthesia. <laughs> But not by saying it, but by also telling them, you know, you need to work hard for that. Um, it's not an easy path. But for me, as, as long as I can tell them to come in anesthesia, I just say, just please come. It's great. As a woman, it's hoping to be a role model to try and attract more women to do this. Mm. but I always tell them that yes please come and do that that's the best option mm. can I add something thank you very much yeah please Yannicka go on 
No, I'm so eager because I also love this specialty so much. Uh, it's really the best. But you have to you have to know that you must like physi applied physiology. It's good for the head because you have to make fast decisions. It's good for the hands because you have some practical procedures. And it's good for the heart because you can be close to patients whenever and relatives whenever they are very vulnerable. But you must be able to balance several things at the same time. And you must endure labor epidurals over the nights for several years while you are under training. Uh, so those are the things, but it's a really the best specialty there is. May I make a comment? I would really like to second what Yannicka said, you know? <laughs> I wouldn't be doing critical care today if I wasn't an anesthesiologist. I mean, sure. anesthesiologists, as anesthesiologists, we are perioperative physicians. We cut across so many, and we interact with all the specialties. We're with the surgeons and we're also with the physicians in the intensive care unit. And I think it's such a unique specialty. It's, it's really, I'm not saying that because I'm from this background, but I really think it's the best. You know, whether it was COVID or whatever else, you know, when whatever subject you're talking about, an anesthesiologist can understand that because you are a perioperative physician. And that makes me believe it's the best. And in terms of women, I think it's quite a demanding specialty. So you have to be ready and willing to work hard if you want to be an anesthesiologist, but definitely it gives you a lot of rewards once you're an anesthesiologist. I never see an anesthesiologist say, oh, I don't have a job, or I don't have enough work. There's always a shortage of anesthesiologists everywhere across the globe. Wonderful, excellent. You are teaching us so much, and as everyone can see in the audience, we love, we are passionate about our specialty. If you could get back in time, if you could go back in time, what advice would you give yourself as a young trainee starting out in anesthesia? In anesthesia? This is for all of you. I repeat, if you could go back in time, what advice would you give yourselves as a young trainee starting out in anesthesia? Yannicka, would you like to go? Uh, I can start again. I would tell myself you have made the right decision. You are in for a very good, uh, you have found what is good for you. And uh, you should continue as you do. Find good role models yourself, work with them, and get yourself some, some uh, friends that you trust in the, uh, so you can discuss all kinds of matters. So you will never be alone. That's what uh, I think is important, to have people who support you and you can support them, pals, and also find good role models. And even though your bosses might be a little bit too much and too harsh sometimes, you are responsible for who you are and how you behave. So don't learn from the stupid people. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just like to add that um, one of the things I was, you know, uh, when, when I started off, I wanted to try to be perfect at everything, you know, try to be a perfect at anesthesiologist, try to be perfect at a wife, a mother and everything. And you can't do this, you know? And I realized that this is not possible. And you try, try your best, but you have to accept that you can't be good at everything and you have to make choices. So to prioritize, you know, don't, because then you will burn out completely. And then you will lose interest in the specialty. And another thing I always advise people, which I didn't do very early on, is find a good mentor, get inspired, you know, find the right person and get on the right track. That's really important because you waste many years of your life just going through the drills. And then you realize that, oh, this is what I want to do. And this is what I, you know, so it's really important to find that person who inspires you, that person who can help you and take you forward and, you know, get advice from that uh, mentor. Thank you so much, Sheila. Bertil? What would you change? What would you tell yourself if you go back in time? I would tell her to just take the exact same path that because she made the right choice. I hesitated to go into anesthesia. And as Sheila was saying, 
find the good mentor and I agree with that. Uh, I found a good mentor that told me to go through that path and I, I think I was very lucky because I always found people that guided me so no regrets whatsoever for going into this and if I had to start again I would go down that path again for sure. Thank you so much Bertil. I think this is a great um, opportunity if you want to help all the women to advance and to move on in, the in this specialty, you can do it by helping them in the mentoring programs at the WFSA. Both modalities can be found in our website, in the WFSA website, if you want to be a mentor of, or if you want to be mentored. And a last question to close our webinar, which is related to what we have been sharing, what we have been talking about. If you could please comment about your experience on, on the imposter syndrome, your experience, the experience you had with the imposter syndrome. This is something that is always there whenever we have to face out difficult talent, uh, but be thinking that we are imposters, that we cannot face them. This is not only exclusive from women, also from men suffer from this. So do you have any, any, any experience with the imposter syndrome? Okay, I can start again. Probably I'm not. <laughs> we are not shy, so it's we are just polite, waiting for others to speak. So. <laughs> but uh, but I I think again that uh, well that is inherent in all sensible people uh, that we are sometimes doubting if we are good enough for something. But I think that what Sheila mentioned earlier that we cannot be perfect. And uh, if you are, you are just a normal person, like all other normal persons, and if you have doubts and so on, so other people will have it too, but they might be different on the on the outside. And you know by yourself that you are not more stupid, really. We are not more stupid than other people. We have gone through many years of training and so on. So, so if we try to to uh, be be on a mental level or or theoretical level we will see that, uh, understand that, well, I was good too. I mean, and it's good enough and so and so. And we should help each other by not only criticizing and so, but praising. Criticize in private, praise in public and try to support each other. Uh, and, and we as older people or more senior, we can often sense when people are suffering from the imposter syndrome. And then we can try to support those people who we sense need it more specifically. I, I second what Yannicka says. And, you know, I, I experienced that a lot, especially in the beginning. I used to feel that, oh, am I good enough? Are they just calling me because they want, uh, you know, me as a woman? And, you know, will I be able to deliver? So at that time, when you feel in confident and that's the time you have to, you know, say, no, I'm going to do it and go ahead and, you know, now I've realized I see many women feeling that way. And it's very important for those who've been through that to go and say, no, you'll be good. You'll be great. Encourage them, you know, give them that confidence because they really need that. And I think all of us at some phase have gone through this and we've all experienced imposter syndrome. So I think on the other side, to go up to people who may not be as confident or feel so that they're the right person for this it's important to, uh, you know, uh, sort of um, give them the courage and give them the strength and so that they can have the confidence to go ahead. Thank you so much, Sheila. Bertil, just a few words from you. As my colleague said, I wonder whether I moved out of this. I feel like I still feel that now. Is it because I'm a woman and they think it's great because I'm a woman, so they call me? You know, I'm still wondering that sometimes. Um, 
you know, it's very often men that are teaching and every time they invite me to a conference uh, and ask people and say, do you think that's good? Do you think I should do that? And everybody's like, yes, it's perfect. What you've done is perfect. But I'm never convinced that what I've done is great, you know. But you see, but if you don't listen to what we're telling you, we tell you it's great. Don't ask us if you don't believe us. You know, it's great. What you've done is good. And but we always think that we've not done good enough. Uh, and if if you were not giving good conferences, good presentation, we wouldn't call you anymore. So, and very recently, I think it was two weeks ago, we had a conference. And one of my colleagues came to see me with students. And um, I I know her name, but I've ne I'd never met her. And I said, oh, you are this person. And it's about this. Uh, and no, it's not that. It's just uh, you are the idol of that student. And I couldn't believe it. I was like, uh, how can I be a role model to someone? I, I couldn't believe it, you know, but it happened. <laughs> but you still wonder um, and you're like, oh, is that really possible? Is it really me, you know? So I, I that's my comment on this imposter syndrome. Thank you so much, Bertil. We could be here for another hour or even more with all the questions we have uh, in the Q&A in the Q&A chat. But unfortunately, our time has run out. And on behalf of the WFSA, I want to thank our panelists from sharing their views, their experiences, for giving us the steps we need to, to take to move on as women in our professional lives, having keeping that balance with our personal life. Um, thank you very much to everyone, all of the all the panelists, uh, all the audience, everyone in the audience to celebrate this International International Women's Day with these amazing women who have talked us so much. Congratulations, and may you have a wonderful rest of your day. Congratulations. Thank you very much.